All right. So we did. Uh, we had a longitudinal survey of uh, rural urban migration in 15 cities. And based on that data, between 2012 and 2013, even though the GDP um, growth dropped dramatically, the wage level of migrant workers increased by 12%. And then 2013 and 2014, another 7%. And during that period, we know many migrant workers has uh, lost their jobs. But despite that, wage continue to increase. And most people think this is the sign that China has run out of surplus labor. And we just come to the, the Louis turning point. And therefore, no matter what you do, you don't, the labor supply is drying out. And, and I, I have always been um, saying that this is not the sign of China run out of surplus labor. It's mainly the institutionally induced. So in this paper, I want, ah, I want to show you that figure. That's why I came here for, um, to show the, that despite the, the reduction of GDP growth, the migrant wage, that's the lowest skilled wage, keep on increasing. And so, So in this paper, I, I want to see, to say three things. One is the, um, the reason behind migrant wage increase and how misreading of China's um, my, the, the wage increase and labor supply situation has generated the um, bad consequences. And finally, what are the, 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 the new urbanization strategy the government implemented uh, maybe have uh, further implication on the future of labor market tension. So the, thing, the first thing I want to talk about is the, what's the reason behind the significant increase in migrant wages? And I believe that it could be two things. One is the labor shortage, either the absolute shortage, there's no more labor, or it, it's um, government policy induced shortage, institutionally induced labor supply shortage. And the second one could be the government direct action. And I want to argue that it was the institutional induced shortage together with government direct action generated the labor, um, the wage increase. So to say that there's no absolute shortage of labor, and I look at the 2014 the National Bureau of Statistical Aggregated Data, that shows that China has 770 million labor force. And of those, 28% are urban hukou labor force, and 70% are rural hukou labor force. Of those, only 30% migrated to city to work. And then the remaining 70%, 19% were working in non-agriculture sector, but in the rural area. And there's still 51% remaining in agriculture jobs. So are there labor shortage? Is it because the agriculture needed this 50% of labor force? And well, this is a picture I took when I went to visit a village during the spring uh, planting season in uh, uh, Hubei province. And people are playing mahjong. And well, this was uh, around 300 households. And I, I, 
honestly, I saw no less than 100 people playing in different uh, venue during that period. And they, yes, they are. And they are, there's no, it's not just old people. There, there are many younger people there as well. And then I want to say the rural remaining workers, whether they are suitable for urban workers, if we know that urban sector need them and they are not moving to the city, maybe because they can't, they can't get the job. And so lots of people talk about this. They say, well, over 40, it's not, it's not suitable for moving. And over 40, they, are, they, they just can't move. And it may be true. And I, I do have some data to show that they are mainly the old people. This is using um, China Family Panel Survey 2012. Our own data for rural sample, we only up to 2010, so I want to see whether this is consistent. I still get the same picture. That is the younger people going to the city to work, and the second younger people work in the rural area, but non-agriculture sector. And those who work in non-agriculture, agriculture sector remaining in the rural area, majority of them are over 35 and up to 65. So it is true they are older. And then, uh, and the second, oh, no, I want to go back. So if this is the case, then maybe it's true that they can't go to city. But I want to say that particular argu argument missed two important points. The first point is when these people who are currently in the rural area doing agriculture, when they were young, they were migrants. 30% of them are return migrants based on our data. And so if they, there's no huko restrictions, they would have stayed like any urban people, right? So the churnings are huge. They, on average, they stay in the city for nine years because their children go to school, their, um, their parents are sick, they have to go back because there's no uh, services supply um, for them. So that's the one point. The second point is, now that the labor supply in the city is drying out, these older people do seem to stay longer. So I have the migrant survey data with um, 2008 and 2014, which you can see the age distribution has changed dramatically. The, the younger, the older cohort seems to account for for larger proportion now. The second point is the most important point. That is whether they are unskilled or old or whatever, this is the labor force we have. So this should be the comparative advantage we have. If China are changing the, um, the industry structure because you think these people are useless, then the resources allocation will not be efficient. So that's the, the point which I think it's very important in understanding current Chinese labor market tension. Okay, that's about whether China have labor shortage or not. And I think we don't have absolute labor shortage, but the institutional induced one. The second point is wage increase is also government direct um, action. 
So China introduced minimum wage in 1994. In 2004, the regulation was revised, and the penalty increased from 20 to 100 percent to 100 to 500 percent for minimum wage uh, violation. And the 12 five-year plan uh, suggested that minimum wage should increase by at least 13 percent annually. So this is the um, for the 15 city in our survey. The, the level of increase of minimum wage over this time. And to minimum wage binding, and in many developing countries, they, they do not. And when I plotted the standardized wages um, against the minimum wage, the, um, the red line in the middle, we can see that the spike is almost in the right place. So it's largely binding. And you can see the, the information from the, the wage data. And then I estimated this, um, whether minimum wage have the spillover effect or not, which uh, you generate the dummy variable for different wage decile and then interact with the minimum wage for each city for each year. And which suggests that the impact seems to focus on the first two decile. And whether this, uh, uh, at the, the, for the level, it has long lasting e effect. But if I take first difference, after the second decile, it becomes statistically insignificant. So it suggests the minimum wage has some spillover effect, not just for the group which are below or at minimum wage, but also the wage level above minimum wage have some impact. And then uh, first, First difference, yeah. So another way to show that minimum wage may have played a role is to look at the unemployment. If the, this, the wage increase is generated mainly by labor shortage, then we should see significant drop of unemployment. And we have three measures of unemployment. One is, are you currently unemployed? One is, last week, whether you have a paid job. The third one is, last 12 months, whether you had at least one episode of unemployment. The first measure is very, very low. The reason for that is our sampling is based on workplace. So we sampled migrants from the workplace, and so they can't be unemployed. And if, if there are any, it's their household member who are unemployed. The second one, uh, well, they don't have unemployment benefits, so when they do have long-term unemployment, they go home. So for migrants, the unemployment rate is quite low. The second one is uh, slightly higher. And we don't see significant drop in that one. And the third one is much higher. And again, we don't see significant drop in that one. The 2008 and 2009 were the issue of the uh, financial crisis. And then later on, we, we see the number stayed in 12% and thereafter. Also, the in significant increase in um, migrant workers' wage could also be related to the government subsidy in agriculture. So the opportunity cost increased, and people would compare to say whether I want to stay here or want to go home, and then the wage can be built up that way. 
So to sum up, in the migrant wage increase part, I want to say there is no absolute labor shortage in China. And institutional induced shortage has been there for a while. A government uh, deliberate policy has contributed to the significant wage increase for migrant workers, which is a good thing, maybe. But we need to understand why it happened. And then the policy should be different. So the second thing is I want to talk about consequence of misreading of this labor shortage. So if labor shortage is because China ran out of labor, then the response should be, we should upgrade the industry. We should become more um, capital and technology intensive. But if this is generated by institutional uh, restrictions, then the redu reducing the restrictions should be response. But the issue is, the government seems to believe that it's absolute shortage. So the response was, there's lots of talking about upgrading industry. So as the government misdiagnosed the problem over the past five to eight years, many coastal area, even inland cities, embarked on the industry upgrading. And we want to change from the world factory into the world laboratory. And also, many cities use minimum wage as a way to push out the, the, pro, the low profit firm so that they can upgrade the industry. Uh, so we, I think it's uh, very obvious from our data. Uh, we can see that manufacturing, um, ooh, wrong one. the manufacturing um, workers has reduced dramatically. And this is uh, two census we conducted for the two years in the 15 cities. And the manufacturing industry is here. And 2007, we have over 20%. By 2012, it's dropped to below 15% of manufacturing workers. And many of factories have been pushed outside of the city boundaries and many manufacturing jobs are pushed to small cities. And more importantly is many labor intensive manufacturing has pushed out of China. So that's a, a very important um, issue with regard to what's now. What are we going to do with people who are so uh, less educated, and still staying in the rural area, what are, what's going to happen to them? And so that's um, bring me to the third, third point, that is the open, uh, urbanization strategy and potential challenges. So as demand for low-skilled workers reduced as the result of industrial upgrading in large and medium, cities, um, will the Chinese labor market reach a new equilibrium? Because we keep on saying we're short of labor. Now the industry has upgraded. We don't need labor anymore. Will that give us an equilibrium point? And I think um, the first thing is, uh, is it true that China ran out of the skilled, low skilled labor, if not, can unskilled worker who will be released from agriculture sector by employed in the city, be employed in the city um, where the industrial upgrading has changed the type of labor demanded. 
And the answer to the first one is no, and I have already shown many, many um, things before and today. But more importantly, in spring 2014, I went to a village, and, and the village has 300 households, and they were going, they have 2,000 mu of uh, land. They were going to rent it to a company. The company only need to employ four people from the village to operate in that land. The rest of them will be released from the land. And this is not just happening in one city, one village, but many, many villages around China. So that's a, a big issue. Where are they going to go? So uh, I look at the education distribution of this different group of people. And if we know the migrant workers relative to urban workers are low-skilled workers, relative to their counter counterparts state in agriculture sector, they are much more skilled. If you look at the um, illiterate rate for, the, for those who stayed in agriculture sector, it's very, very high. And it's not just for the average, not just for the old people, the younger generation also have the same trend. So these people are not going to fit in the new industrial structure in the city. And we need to think about what's going to happen to them. So what will they do and where will they go? There's a new um, urbanization plan, 2014-2020. And they have, they believe that farmers can be re released to these cities orderly. And the order is such that mega cities will strictly restrict hukou. And large cities will reasonably constrain the hukou. And cities with one to three million population hukou restrictions can be slightly relaxed. And for 0 0.5 to 1 million cities, hukou restriction can be relaxed orderly. Only for the rural towns, there will be no restriction. So if you now go to Chinese rural area, you can see big high rises building in these little towns, which are mainly empty. And the plan was we will move them all into those high rises. And, but in this big plan, there's no mention of what these people are going to do in these high rises. And I just want to say why this small city strategy might have problem and it, it will be a big issue for China. That's it. First of all, uh, I would like to say I'm very happy to read this paper and to be the uh, uh, commentator for this paper. Uh, for many years, actually, I'm uh, one of the big fans of uh, Professor Meng uh, because of uh, the uh, research style, which is looking into the real uh, phenomenon in China. Uh, for me, I have the general idea that if we are studying China issues, uh, what we need to care about are those really uh, real situation and policy background in China, not only the phenomenon, because the phenomenon we look at could be because of the uh, uh, general uh, outcome of a free market economy, but in China, never forget that China has not been a free market economy. So many things we observe in China should be understood as a phenomenon of uh, um, policy distortion, just like uh, Lewis Turning Point theory. Lewis Turning Point theory is based on free market economy, not a uh, distorted economy. So this is my general idea to look at the uh, issues of uh, China's labor market issues. So I fully agree with Professor Meng in, his, in her paper uh, to say that labor shortage is at least partly a result of current policies, including the system, including minimum wage. In my own research, I also relate uh, the uh, wage growth to land system, land policies, which is the topic of my paper in this afternoon. And the second point is industrial up upgrading should be based on production factor market efficiency. But labor supply in China is restricted. 
and uh, wage is raised because of uh, some uh, labor market distortions in China. And the labor supply is also controlled, and capital, capital market in China is also distorted because the capital accumulation is uh, sub subsidized by the low interest rate. So the, the interest up Industrial upgrading in China is also distorted in the, um, in the economy. And third, we are implementing a policy uh, encouraging local urbanization <laughs> and the development of small cities and towns. But large cities are actually the places for better jobs and higher income in the researchers. So what I do in the comment is to uh, try to add more uh, evidence to Professor Mohn's arguments to uh, answer the following question, why low-skilled workers have higher wages, uh, high wage growth in the uh, economic development in China? So the first thing I want to uh, add is, maybe Professor Mohn, you can mention more about skill complementarities. In China, we can see that if a city have, sorry, this is the result in my research, if a city have uh, uh, a higher proportion of high-skilled labor, of course, the wages of the, for the high-skilled labor will increase. But look at this. This is wage growth in those cities with higher proportion of high-skilled labor. So if they are complementarities between each other, these uh, low-skilled laborers will benefit from the uh, accumulation of human capital of the uh, cities. So if the skill and complementarities exist in China, and high-skilled laborers are encouraged to stay because many people, many cities, they welcome college graduates, while low-skilled labor are restricted from staying permanently. So this supply and demand will change. Supply of uh, the low-skilled laborers are restricted, but demand of the low-skilled laborers will be increased by, you know, encouraging those high-skilled laborers to stay. And secondly, if uh, the skill complementarities uh, exist in the Chinese labor market, a greater number of high-skilled labor, high-skilled workers will increase will increase the productivity of low-skilled laborers. So that's because of skill complementarity. So this also explains why you know the wage growth of labor, low-skilled labor, will increase faster. This is not because of uh, elimination of uh, discrimination, but it's just because of discrimination. Because the discrimination changes the skill composition of the labor market. So, right. So this is my first argument. Second, let us look at the skill distribution of small and large cities. Let us compare China and the United States. This is a graph I cut from a paper. This is uh, the skill distribution. You can understand this uh, horizontal axis as skill. And this is skill distribution for small cities and large cities. This is for small cities and this is for large cities. You can see that for large cities, they have both more high skill laborers and more unskilled laborers because they are complementarities. Then how about China? This is the situation of China. This is for large cities and this is for small cities. You can see that they only have more high skilled laborers, but much less small, uh, much less low skilled laborers. So if they are complementarities, it is very natural for you to see that the wage of this part of labor will increase faster, right? So this is another thing I want to show. And then let's, let us look at the uh, distribution of the uh, uh, skill, uh, different uh, skill level laborers in large and small cities. So we can see this uh, table. This is for small cities. This is for large cities. And this is the uh, proportion of uh, uh, high skilled. And this is for medium uh, skilled. This is for low skilled. You can see that the large cities have significantly lower proportion in low skilled laborers, but much higher proportion of uh, high skill laborers, right? And uh, whether this is related to hookah system, fortunately, a sociologist in China uh, constructed an index for hookah system. The higher the hookah system, uh, hookah index is, the stricter the uh, hookah system uh, restriction is. So you can see that if this is higher, the low skill laborers will have a lower <laughs> proportion, but much higher uh, proportion of uh, high skill labor in the city. So this is really related to the hukou system itself, to change the, the skill composition of the labor force. And uh, I want to also show two more straightforward evidences related to city size. The, uh, in Professor Meng's paper, uh, she said that uh, low skill laborers, they go to large cities because uh, they have uh, higher income and jobs here. So first, I want to uh, use my paper to show that large cities, they do have lower unemployment rate, especially for low-skilled laborers. 
So this is the result I want to show. I use a two-stage least, two least square estimation. I don't want to talk about what is the <laughs> instrument I use, but here I only want to show you the result. Here you can see that whatever we use to measure the size of a city, the total population of a city, or the number of college graduates of the city, you can see that it will increase the employment prob uh, uh, probability here. And this is also uh, positive. But when I separate my sample into you know, people uh, with education less than nine years, or between nine to 12, or greater than 12 years, you can see that the coefficient is much larger here. I mean, because they have demand. So the city size will increase the employment probability for the low-skilled laborers greater. Right, so this is the uh, result I want to show. And then why do you have job opportunities in the city? So this is the correlation between the share of manual jobs in the city and the city size measured by the population. So the larger cities will ha have um, more manual jobs to satisfy the, the, the uh, job demand of the uh, uh, low-skilled labor. So this is the channel. And I also want to add this end evidence, which is also based on my own research. You know, China is now encouraging townization, <laughs> which is the development of small cities. This is a word I create, you know. But the question is whether this development of uh, those small towns and small cities can be separated from the development of large cities. This is my research result. It's the distance to major cities. In my research, the major cities refers to those very large 14 uh, large cities. And this is the annual growth rate of those medium and small cities. You can see what? The farther the city is from the major cities, their growth rate will be lower. So encouragement doesn't, <laughs> you know, you need, to, you need to move people towards the place where they can find jobs rather than move resources to those small cities and towns. It doesn't make sense to, to just increase the GDP growth by investment, but there is no efficiency, right? So this is my uh, research, what, I, what my research can show. Finally, do we have evidence on the effects of land policy and minimum wage? The answer is clearly yes. Uh, you know, Professor Mo showed something <laughs> about the effects of uh, minimum wage, but in uh, my paper this afternoon, I will show you the effects of uh, uh, land policy and minimum wage uh, again, uh, but wait, <laughs> wait for my uh, presentation in the next session. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you for that self-promoting uh, advertisement. For the ab if that's right. <laughs> uh, comments and uh, questions? Hi, uh, nice presentation, but I haven't heard anything about the cost of living because the cost of living in cities has also increased. So does it has any role to play in the migration decision? Because if your wage differential is lower than the uh, cost of living differential in rural and urban area, it doesn't make any sense for a person to migrate. And that, that's what we have been observing in India. We don't have hookah system. But uh, if you go and visit any firm in urban center, like let's say uh, Bangalore, I recently visited few, a few firms, and the firms are complaining that we have labor shortage, but still our 50% of people are in the agriculture sector. The simple thing is that the cost of living, particularly the, particularly the housing, has increased so high in the urban center that people are not ready to move there. So I would like to have your comment. of 60%, 40 to 60%, I think over time it changes, of uh, migrant workers are uh, living in dormitories and uh, factory or, or the employer provided um, accommodation. And I agree with you, the cost of living is an important issue, but part of the cost of living is generated by these institutional restrictions. So migrants in the city, they pay much higher fees for education, for, for health, for all the, the service, public services. So that's the major part of the issue.
Thank you. That, that was a very nice paper. Um, you might actually use parallels from um, what's been happening in Europe, that the policy that you said will not work, in fact, it's been tried in Europe, especially in Britain, over uh, decades, and, and it, it fails. You know, the, In fact, the whole attempt of Britain is the same as China, is to stop uh, people from coming to the south, especially around London and in the southeast. And, and they uh, implemented policies, they call them regional policies, where they try and move jobs to places like Newcastle and the northeast, northwest, and so on, to make people move. But in fact, they, they don't. It's a, waste, it's a waste of money. And many of those, and also Northern Ireland, they tried it on. And most of those factories have closed down. And in the end, only public sector jobs have remained up there. You know, like like I live in London, but my tax office is in, is in Newcastle, you know, that kind of, of, of thing. But, but there are policies who fail, you know, because what it shows is that human capital is is more uh, fixed than uh, physical capital in the end, at the end of the day, and you just cannot move there. The problem is much more deep-rooted. It's coming out of the plant economy, um, the mentality. Everything has to be orderly. And from the beginning, they say, we want rural people to leave the land, but not leave their hometown. That, that's the slogan from the beginning. And they never changed. And anything about it, I, <laughs> I can. I had a couple of remarks. Among. One is that even though minimum wages have been going up very fast in China, they actually haven't been going up as fast as wages uh, you know, since the mid-2000s. And so as a share of median wages in China and in some other emerging market countries, it's still relatively low compared to, let's say, the US or other, or other places. Um, so that's just one, one observation. And the, the other comment I had is, I wonder if we're not in, in China kind of sometimes overestimating what we can expect in terms of moving people quickly over, I mean the process of labor mobility in most countries is a very slow process because you know people just don't like to leave where they were born and grew up and villages and whatnot. Um, and you know even though I'm certain, certainly the institutional issues are affecting incentives and whatnot, there's also just a lot of, we don't really know what the reservation wages of these people are. Maybe they just love playing mahjong, or maybe they really are attached, especially older people. So even if, so I'm, I'm just, it still leaves a lot of questions, I think, uh, that remain open in terms of how much policy reform will really change the allocation of, or the movement of labor uh, in China. So on that point, I just want to say that whatever you observe now, it's the result of current institution. So farmers are much happier sitting there playing mahjong because they know if they go to city, there's so many different restrictions. So that, that thing has to be taken into account. No, I'm just saying that in a lot of other places where none of this exists, people also, rural people also don't want to go to cities. Yeah. For, they just don't want to, they don't like the city, they're scared. I mean, there's also things that aren't related necessarily just about change and about um, preferences, really, to some extent. Um, okay, any other last? Okay, so let's close the morning session uh, here.